We have been dealing with um, the life of Nehemiah, and I trust that it has been a blessing to you and helpful to you. Today, we are going to the uh, fourth book of Nehemiah, that is Nehemiah chapter 4, which um, the title of the message is to build and to battle, build and to battle, right? We talked about Nehemiah in various aspects on the area of prayer, on the area of receiving a purpose from God and the planning towards it. And last week, we talked about the people and how the people said, let us start rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Okay, and they rallied together, shoulder to shoulder, next to one another, all kinds of different careers and trades, but there were one cause and one purpose, and that is to build the walls of Jerusalem. And so we can need to capture that same kind of a passion and a vision. I was looking for a suitable song for this Sunday service, and I stumbled along this particular song. It is a Jewish song. So if no, um, you would hear it in Jewish and with a Jewish tune and melody, but I also found out that there was an English translation to it. So I want you to um, watch this video and listen to it, right, and appreciate what it says in this particular song. Yeah. 
So Nehemiah was a man that responded to the call of God and the burden that the Lord placed upon his heart when he saw the ruins of Jerusalem. The purpose of this series of messages is that we would see the ruins that are around us and within us, the walls that are broken, the spiritual lives that are torn, and the people whose lives are being challenged by the difficult needs in their lives. And we will, as a church will respond and say, God, use us to rebuild so was that was a prayer, there was a purpose, there were the plans, and lastly, the people. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the problems that they faced when they, want, when they started rebuilding. It says that when you discover your assignment, your enemies will discover you. And when you step up from others, you'll find that others will try to step on you. That's what Nehemiah faced. So with every vision, know this, that, that there will be opposition and that every work of God will be opposed by the work of Satan. Now, we, we see in Nehemiah's experience that there were many signs of God's hand upon his life. Okay? Um, the king was favorable. He provided the soldiers. He provided the letters of protection. He provided the provision. And he provided a cavalry and an army to travel together with Nehemiah. But soon when he arrived safely, they would leave back to Susa in uh, the Winter Palace. So what was left is this, that when he was there, and, uh, even when he arrived, you find it in the very first chapter, it says that Sanballat and Tobiah were disturbed that someone has come from the capital city wanting to do something for the people of Israel. And in chapter 2, they were also, you know, they began opposing them when they heard of the plans that they wanted to rebuild the walls. And so when chapter 3 came along and the people started working and building and everyone in different sections, you find that the very start of chapter 4 says these words, when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was very greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and the, in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? We would think that when God tells us to do something and His favor rests upon it and we find that that's the will of the Lord, we think that everything should go very smoothly, but on the contrary. And this we must take note of because many people are, you know, being distracted or discouraged. They think that they've heard from God and when they step into it, thinking that everything would open up, they find that there are enemies standing at every doorway. And they quickly retreat back into their own silos, coming to the conclusion that I don't think so God will have called me. Otherwise, I would not meet with so much opposition. But let me tell you this, after this so many years of being in the ministry, every time you want to step out on faith to do something for God, you will find that there will be the presence of enemies that will try to oppose you. Either systems or policies or individuals who will just disagree with what you are trying to do for the Lord. And so Sanballat stood mocking, ridiculing, the Jews who were attempting to rebuild the wall. So not only Sanballat was involved in it, the scripture says Tobiah, in verse 3 of chapter 4, Tobiah the Ammonite says, who was at his side, said, what are they building? If even a fox climbed up on it, he would break down their wall of stones. Now, foxes here are, are not very common here in Malaysia, but it says that the size of a fox is like the size of a dog, 
right? So what is it saying? That even if a dog would jump on top of your wall, if you ever complete it, it will not even stand the weight of a dog and it says it will all crumble down. So there was mockery, there was ridicule. So we've got to understand this, that the very first thing that the people faced was what is called the psychological warfare. It was a warfare of the mind. It was the ridicule. It is the uh, enemies despising them and mocking them. Have you ever tried some, to do something new and uh, you find people say, are you sure you're going to do that? Will it ever succeed? Do you have the abilities? You know, uh, anyone who starts, try, first thing to do, anyone who tries to start a business, 85% of all people will fail, you know? Are you willing to do that? And they will dump in a lot of negative things and you are almost about to give up even before starting. And there'll be self-doubt. You wonder whether you're capable, whether you have the ability, whether you have the stamina. The enemy will attack you left and right with a lot of arrows. I will say this to you, that it is not just only that it may come, but it says, I'm telling you, it will come. When you try to attempt something for God especially, Satan will not leave you alone. But what Nehemiah showed us is this, when, when we face opposition, we must not be afraid. We must not step backwards. We must not retreat. How did Nehemiah respond? Nehemiah responded in chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. He says, Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins apart from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. It's a very uncommon prayer, but he prayed. Now, someone says, wow, such strong words, you know. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Okay, that's all right, because they were despised. Then it says, turn the insults back. It means whatever they wish for us, boomerang it back and hit them. Then give them over to plunder in the land of captivity. Because the, the Israelites were the ones who came back from captivity, isn't it? After 70 years. And it says, that, let these people be captured and they in turn be taken as captives. But when he goes on, he says, do not cover up the guilt or blot out the sin from your sight. Some people may think that, wow, did, did, did Nehemiah say, you know, don't forgive them? Uh, no. uh, it says, um, do not blot out the sins from your sight. It's almost like a prayer to, that they will go to hell. <laughs> now, um, it's not that Nehemiah was wishing them that their, these enemies would go to hell, but rather it says that do not let them escape without your punishment. Really deal with them so that they will know that they have sinned against you and sinned against your people. So he called out to the name of the Lord. And that's a very, very important principle for you and I to understand. That when you face troubles, when you face difficulties, that's the time what? Turn to the Lord. Call out His name. That should be the first response of a true believer. Call upon the name of the Lord. We've got to call upon Him. When there are problems, call upon the name of the Lord. When there are difficulties, call upon the name of the Lord. When there are opposition, call upon the name of the Lord. What you are going through now, what you are experiencing right now, call upon the name of the Lord. He hears. Nehemiah is setting for us a model on how to handle opposition and difficulties. Call upon the name of the Lord. So when after Nehemiah prayed that prayer, what happened? Did God strike Sanballat and Tobiah and the um, enemies? In fact, it almost seems that God did not do anything. But what God did was this, God worked in the hearts of the people whose people who were praying. 
That is in verse 6 of chapter 4. So after his prayer, he says this, So we rebuild the wall until all of it reach its half, its height, for the people work with all their hearts. So in the midst of opposition, instead of giving up, instead of walking away from it, after they're praying to God to ask God to act, God did not act in the hearts of His enemies, but God worked in the hearts of His people. And you find it often that is, we would leave what? The vengeance to God, right? You call upon the name of the Lord, it is up to Him when He would act towards the enemy. It is much better for us to pray than to go and fight ourselves, right? And, and uh, fight the battle on our own, right? Leave it to the Lord. Ask God to act. But God began to work in the hearts of His own people. And how did he? He gave them a heart to work. He gave them a commitment to continue on its labors. The scripture says, So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. It is an amazing word. The little con no, uh, the conjunction word is a so. There was opposition, there was prayer, so they rebuilt the wall. It is so amazing, isn't it? Uh, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of you know, um, problems, let us be the people who say, so we would continue to rebuild. The resolve to continue the work of the Lord must be strong in our hearts. And they rebuilt. And they did it so quickly that the wall was built up to half of its height. And the reason being is because God gave them a heart to work. When you put your heart to it, the work is joyful and the work proceeds much further. I think it was just yesterday or this morning, I saw one guy, you know, wearing a t-shirt. He says, love I know, do what you love and love what you do, right? And um, that, that was printed on his, on his T-shirt. Do what you love and love what you do. When it comes to rebuilding, when it comes to ministry, when it comes to reaching out with, to people, when it comes to sharing the gospel with people, love what you do and do what you love. It will bring us a long, long way for us to do that. Work with all your heart. And, uh, and the, under the KJV, it says the people had a mind to work. They had a mind to work. They committed themselves to it. So what happened as they were building, as they were committing themselves, and everybody was doing the work, Sanballat and uh, the group came again in verse 7 and 8. But it says, when Sanballat and Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men of Ashdod. Now there was a bigger group. At first it was individuals. It was the chief is Sanballat. Then there was Tobiah. Then there was Geshem, the Arab. Now, it says they brought everybody, the Arabs, the Ammonites, the men of Ashdod, heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's wall had gone ahead, and the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. So from psychological warfare to deal with our minds and to confuse us, they right now were planning for a physical warfare, whereby they are about to plan to attack the people in Jerusalem. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 9, it says, what did Nehemiah respond? It says, we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. So what did Nehemiah do again? Nehemiah prayed. In verse 4, he prayed that prayer. The prayer was listed for us. Right now, in verse 9, going to the physical warfare, Nehemiah again prayed. So Nehemiah did not just only pray for four months before. 
or be just before the king. But he prayed at every point as the work was progressing. And every time he kept prayer as the central piece of weapon that he has, that connection it has with God. So pray. Pray at all times, Paul tells us. Pray unceasingly. Keep on praying and praying and praying. But here, because it was a physical you know, uh, attack, he did not just only pray, but he prayed and what? He posted. Now today, the word posted has a different name, meaning to it. When we post, you know, he did not pray and post it on Facebook. I've seen people say, hey, please pray for me. Nah. You know, I'm, 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 I'm speaking in this place. And he get all of his cyber, you know, uh, his Facebook fans to, to pray for them for, for, uh, for a particular assignment. But uh, we, we are not here to uh, post the things and uh, get the others on the internet involved. But it says, we prayed to God and posted a God. That means they stationed God by day and by night to meet this threat. So there's a very practical thing that Nehemiah did. Prayer is one thing, but he also what? Posted a God. Because right now, there is physical danger that is there. But he had another challenge, one more challenge that is this. In Nehemiah chapter 10, uh, verse 10. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. And there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Now it is not Sanballat and Tobiah and the enemies. Now it is the men who are doing the work. The men of Judah, you know that Jerusalem is in the region of Judah. So it's the men of Judah that were there. Judah is supposed to be a people of praise. Judah is, a, is the you know, uh, the, what is that, the tribe whereby kings would come forth and the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah. But here, the people of Judah were weary, were tired. There is a limit to physical strength. And oftentimes, the most crucial time is the half time. You look at games, of how games are being played. Sometimes uh, 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 one team may be leading a one nil, you know, uh, advantage, and they go into half time. And after that, after half time comes out, the other losing team could score two goals, and they turn the tables around, right? Why? Right? Some go in the half time overconfident, but the half time thing is a very very important time. Because that's where the time, in any project as well, it is hard to kick it off. But once you start off and the people are motivated, they are very you know, encouraging. It says, let's do it. They, they see the dream, they see the vision, and they start rebuilding it. And as the work progresses, midway, yes, there's some progress going on, but they realize also there are enemies around. They realize that their strength is depleting. And they say, they look ahead. There is still so much work that has not been done yet. And that's where it's easy for people to fall out of because of discouragement. So it says, we cannot do it. We are tired. And this is what they face, an internal emotional warfare. The psychological warfare was outside. The physical warfare was outside. Right now, what they faced was an internal emotional warfare. They were feeling tired. The strength is ebbing away. Those first two warfare did not fizzle out, did not go away, but this was added onto it. Because later on, you find that, you know, um, Sanballat and Tobiah continued to threaten. And this time, and it says that we would strike them when they do not realize it. We would kill each one of them before even they notice. That's what it says in verse 11 and 12 of chapter 4. Our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we'll kill them. 
and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. So they begin a plan to really attack the Jews. It was all spoken outside of Jerusalem, but some people caught wind of it and began to tell Nehemiah. So people have been hearing it again and again and again and again. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming at a time whereby we are not aware of their arrival and they will kill us. So what did Nehemiah do? In verse 13, Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. In the beginning, it was all prayer. He prayed, and he prayed, and he set aside a guard, just a small number to take charge, look after the people. This time, with a greater danger, he says we're going to make sure that put God... No, the families nearest, at the lowest points of the wall. And what gave them weapons of a sword, spear, and a bow? The enemy is coming. You have got to have the weapons to fight against it. And so he stationed them. And not only that, he did what was strategic as a good leader, and then he stood up before the people in verse 14, and this was what he said. He said this, don't be afraid of them. We need to hear that, isn't it, today? Don't be afraid of what is happening around you. Don't be afraid of the challenges that you are facing. Don't be afraid because the spirit of fear is not from God. God has not given the spirit of fear, but has given the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. So when you are fearful, when the facts stare you into the face, we don't discount the facts. He says, yes, it is there, but yet I will choose to fill my heart with faith and trust in the Lord. God will see me through. So not only do not fear what is around you, but Nehemiah said this, Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. See, when they hear so much about the enemy, when they see that the rubble, there is so much in the work that is undone, right? And they see their own hearts that are, all, that are weak. And they started even to entertain. Maybe Sanballat said it's true. Maybe we are really feeble. Maybe we are too weak to actually do the work. And it starts gnawing and eating them up. Nehemiah pointed the people back and just looked at the Lord. This is not your fight. This is not your wall, though obviously it is the wall of Jerusalem, but this is God's project and God will come to your rescue. He is great and God is awesome. When we have problems, we see our problems being so big and it blinds us and we cannot see God. God says, move that problem aside. See how big your God is. He says He is great and He is awesome. That's why we have worship. Worship is not just only a time before the preaching of the Word of God. Worship is to set our eyes on the greatness of God. And when we see how great God is, it builds up your faith. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. You are being bought with a price. Your body is no longer your own. You belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of your life. Know that He is for you, not against you. Know that He stands with you, who goes before you. He surrounds you. He will never leave you, nor forsake you. He shall fight for you, and He shall defend you. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And Nehemiah says, Fight for your brothers. Fight for your sons and your daughters. Fight for your wives. Fight for your families. Fight for the honour of God. During this time, the people are facing challenges in their families. They see their children getting, going away from the Lord, not listening to them. Or something is happening within the marital life between husband and wife and things are drawing apart because of the many hours 
or of being in a, in a house, the friction gets more difficult. And you may be at a point of despair, you may be at a point of saying it's too much. And you are willing to surrender and give it all up. But the Word of God tells you this, that when the difficulty comes and rises, your enemy is trying to destroy your health. He's trying to destroy your family. He's trying to destroy your marriage. He's trying to destroy your career. He's trying to destroy your future. And Nehemiah tells us, and in fact, God is saying to you and I, fight for your family. Fight for your children. Get down on your knees and pray to Almighty God. And it says, and stand up to the forces of darkness. This is not a time to be weak and to give up. But this is a time for you to know who you are in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 15, it tells us when their enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and God had frustrated it. The enemies were discouraged and we all returned back to the wall, each to his own work. And what happened? At first it was posting a guard. Then they were guarding the lowest places. And in fact, there came a time, everybody was just acting as a soldier. They were fighting. And after the danger, you know, the immediate danger is gone, he says, they placed down and they went back to rebuild the wall. That's why it says they return each to his own work. So for a short time, there was no work that was done. It was only fighting. Getting ready to fight. Though, in the final analysis, there was no actual armed conflict between the two groups, but they were ready to fight. So this is what it says in verse 16 and 18. From that day on, Half of my men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears and shields and bows and armour. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon with another. Each of the builders wore his own sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Half of them worked, half of them held weapons. The thing is this, it was build and battle, battle and build. They were ready for both. This is what needs to happen for you and I. As we go and rebuild, there will be battles that you have to fight. Battle and build, build and battle, it goes hand in hand. Sometimes it needs to be building more and you know, getting ready to battle. Sometimes it's battling more and, you know, and uh, pausing on the building. But it goes hand in hand. Build and battle, battle and build. In fact, in verse 19 to 20, it says, I said to the nobles and the rest of the work, the people, the work is extensive and spread out. So we are widely spread out from each other from the wall. Wherever you hear the trumpet of the sound of the trumpet, join us. Our God will fight for us. That is in verse 20. When you hear the sound of the trumpet, this is what happens. Nehemiah says, everyone, right, will have a sword and will have a, 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 a tool to rebuild. And you've got to be prepared for both. The person who will stay with me is a trumpeter. It says, when the trumpet sound, can we have the trumpet sound? When you hear the trumpet sound, everybody, wherever you are, at which part of the wall, come to this place and we will rally and we would fight. If the trumpeter will sound and it says there's a weakness at this wall and the trumpet will sound, And it says that then everybody would come to this side of the wall and we would stand together and we would fight. When you hear the sound of the trumpet, we have to muscle in, come together. You don't just do your own thing. You don't just carry on your own work. We've got to come, defend each other, no, be at the same place to ward off the enemy. As I started this morning, and it says there's a call for, no, for the next six days, 
starting from tomorrow on Holy Monday and Holy Tuesday and Holy Wednesday and Monday, Thursday and Good Friday, Holy Saturday, we are going to spend six days of prayer and fasting. We're going to ask the Lord to help us to move forward. We're going to ask the Lord to help us to rebuild, to touch lives, that the gospel of Jesus Christ will go far and wide. Many people are hurting that God will use us to reach out to people. We want to fast and to pray. There is a call of the trumpet. It's a call for the trumpet for you to rise, to rebuild. A call of the trumpet for you to battle. But that's not just it. There is one more thing is this. If you look at the last verse of Nehemiah chapter 4, it says this, Nehemiah and his men says, we're not going to move outside of the walls. We're going to all stay inside. It's going to be a lockdown. It was a willing lockdown. They locked themselves down within the perimeter's wall to guard it, to work at it. And it says that, soldier, that they did not even change their clothes. Wherever they went, even to pick up water, they, was all, they were always carrying a sword with them. They were always armed. And it tells us this, you and I are living in the last days and we need to be fully armed with the armour of God at all times. Waiting right now is a time for us to rally to the battlefield for spiritual battle, but we're also waiting when the final trumpet is going to be sounded and when Christ returns, that we shall be ready. Listen to the trumpet. 